Hey, Connection Point, I hope you're having a great Christmas season. This year has just flown by. I don't know if you feel like me. I cannot believe how fast 2019 has gone. We have got an amazing Christmas Eve planned. Be praying, be inviting, pick up some invites on your way out today. We are believing in God to use us to connect many, many people to Jesus at our seven Christmas Eve services this year. Well, this week I am catching my breath. I get to shadow a senior pastor in California of a church that's a bit larger than ours, and I'm just learning from him all the things I don't know as a younger lead pastor who's doing my best. So be praying for me. And today you get to hear from someone who does know what he's doing and has been doing it for a long time, former lead pastor of this church, Steve Reeves. If you're our guest or if you're new with us in the last year or two, Steve was the lead pastor here at Connection Point for 31 years. He's an amazing man of God, an amazing pastor, and an amazing speaker. So would you open your hearts and would you put your hands together and give Steve Reeves a big Connection Point welcome home. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's just good to be home. There is no place like home. That's really the truth, isn't it? And we've been really busy, um, going to continue to be busy, uh, coaching churches and things like that. Uh, if you can believe, I had just, a, just the last week, I had a church from Florida and a church from Scottsdale, Arizona. They want me to come there in January and February. <laughs> just serving Jesus. That's all I'm doing is serving Jesus. <laughs> when you're surrendered, you're surrendered. You know what I'm saying? But my wife has have said two words for two and a half years, which is only God. I mean, what God has done here has been tremendous. And what God is doing, allowing us to continue to do, to be refired. That's what I am, energized without the pressure now. And uh, really enjoying our time together. But there's no, nothing better than enjoying being a grandparent, that's for sure. And a uh, parent, just like you this season of the year. Kids are amazing, aren't they? Kids are a bear, aren't they? Okay. I mean, it's a great thing. Thanksgiving, we had the whole crew in. We had all three kids uh, over for Thanksgiving. We had three of our, our, our all three granddaughters. Here's a picture of our three granddaughters on uh, Thanksgiving Day. This is Sylvie and Everly and Lucille. We call her Lou. And uh, one of our granddogs, Penny Lane, came. And we even had an overnight without the parents. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so it really had, had a good time with them. Now they have a little loft upstairs where Kristen, Gigi, and the, the girls hang. So like they'll come in and go, go, Gigi upstairs. They look at me like, Papa, sit in your chair and watch your TV and we'll be fine. And so they're up doing their thing. They have so much fun up there. She's created that little environment for them. And so the other night when they stayed overnight, she had prayer with them. And uh, as soon as she finished uh, the prayer, one of them, I'm not going to tell on her because she'll be embarrassed later on, but one of them, look, after the prayer looked up, she said, Gigi, I opened my eyes twice during the prayer. <laughs> Gosh, it's hard to raise kids, isn't it? But yet, don't you love their authenticity? You know, we're not as likely to tell somebody if I open my eyes during the prayer. <laughs> or other things. But kids are just like the real deal, you know? And so they change your world. If we'll pay attention, they help us with our world and navigate. God said, let you become like a child, teachable, innocent, authentic. You won't enter the kingdom of heaven. So that's just kind of a good reminder. And Christmas has a way of doing that for us. We're going to talk today about Mary. And John asked me to teach as a part of this series, Let There Be Joy. I said, I'd like to teach on the section of Mary and her life. That was a very difficult season for her. Because Christmas, for some of you, it's the most wonderful time of the year. For others of you, it's the most painful time of the year. For some of you, it's always been great, but this particular season, because there's something going on this Christmas, somebody won't be with you in the house this year for the first time. And that's a game changer. And so it can be a tough season, but even in the tough season, as you learned last week from John, joy is not something that happens on the outside in circumstances. It has to be on the inside. It's the presence of God in the midst of pain and struggles of life, as well as the joys of life. And Mary teaches us that. Mary was a real person. Jesus really was a person. He was born as a baby at a time and place. 
It was a little place called Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth is about 70,000 people today. We've been there twice. Uh, we took a tour to Israel with people from the church here. Some of you might remember when you went with us. Nazareth was one of the most hostile places we went to. It's very inviting for Is. Islam, but not for Christianity. The Bible says Jesus, the prophet, is not honored in his hometown, and that's still that way today. But 70,000 people today, and if you go there, here's like pictures of the Church of the Annunciation is there. Um, there, are modern, there are lots of markets that are there, anything you want to buy, all kinds of modern buildings and things like that. But it's not that way. It was not that way in Jesus' time. It was a hick town in Jesus' time. There were about 100 people there, maybe at best. It wasn't a place you'd want to be from. I mean, it's one of those, you might be a redneck if you're from Nazareth, you know. It was that, it really was not uh, a, a, something you'd be bragging about. It was something you'd be almost be embarrassed about. But isn't it just like God to select two teenagers who were sold out to God in Nazareth to perform his miraculous work of the birth of Jesus Christ? Well, we're going to dig into the story today. If you have your Bibles, we're just going to walk through a section of Scripture. That's my favorite thing to do, so let's just look at it together. If you brought your Bibles, Luke chapter 1, the New International Version, what I'll be reading from. But we're going to put the Scriptures on the screen because we want everybody to sit around and study the Bible with us today as we learn some really practical lessons about uh, what do you do when things have you going through, a, when you're going through a difficult season of your life, you're having a particular struggle in your life, an injustice in your life, what do you do? I'm going to give you four things today that I hope will help you. Let's learn from Mary. Luke 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, I'll stop there for just a minute. There's a translation that's actually called the, the Easy English Bible. I like it because it's just really out there. It says Mary um, had never had sex with anyone. It's very specific. So even a child can understand, wow, that's a virgin. We're talking about that kind of a person. But she's pledged to be married to a man named Joseph or betrothed, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, Mary is very much uh, misunderstood by many people in our culture today. Uh, some people think that you actually pray to Mary, okay? Think they can pray to Mary, but when you look at this scripture here, Mary was not divine, okay? Mary was not divine. Some people think it's like she has insider information on getting to Jesus. So they'll pray to, to Mary and think they get to Jesus through Mary, but she herself was a sinner. Later we'll see she sang a song, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You don't need a Savior Okay, unless you're a sinner. She's not unlike godly 14 and 15 year old, year old girls who are in the student ministry of this church. Who just want to surrender to God. And that's who she was. And so God chooses her to do his work. Okay. Now, it's a powerful thing to understand this story. Um, some people think, again, they have this misunderstanding of who Mary is, but you understand the Bible teaches us she was just that common person like us, and she would learn that she would need Jesus' death on the cross to forgive her, her of her sins, just as you and I have no hope of heaven without Jesus dying on the cross for our sin. He's our only hope. So she's not a mediator. There's not a verse in the Bible that teaches. She's a mediator between us and God. We can go directly to God through Jesus Christ. See, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, it says there is one God and one mediator, only one person between us and God who's the link to God, the bridge to God, between God and mankind. It's the man, it's the God-man, Christ Jesus. So it is interesting that this little unknown girl from a nowhere town is going to be so highly esteemed that at every church that honors the Scripture, She'll be honored in this season of the year, 2,000 years later. A lot of misunderstanding of the characters in the Christmas story. I was a little guy who got in trouble a lot. Those of you who know me well, I got in trouble a lot when I was a kid. I've told that over and over again, and it was true. And I was a lot like this kid who 
was always getting in trouble. He started to write out his list, what he wanted for Christmas. He's writing a list to Santa Claus. I want this and this and this for Christmas. And his dad, okay, now it's time to teach this kid a lesson. I mean, we just got to work on this. Maybe, maybe he'll wake up. So he says, son, would you go in and I want you to sit in the living room and look at this manger scene. I want you just to look at this, okay? And as you look at this, um, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about the real meaning of Christmas, okay? And then once you do that, I want you to write a letter, not to Santa Claus, but to Jesus. The real meaning of Christ, and can you do that? Okay, so his dad leaves the room, and so he looks at this, and he begins to write his letter. Dear Jesus, I've been a very good boy. But he realized Jesus knows everything. He said, I better cross that out. Uh, um, he goes, Jesus, I, if you'll bring me everything I want for Christmas, I will be a very good boy all next year. And he knew that wasn't going to happen. He crossed that out. He said, Jesus, if, if you'll give me what I want for Christmas, I'll be good for a whole week, all next week. He, he couldn't pull that off either. He knew he couldn't pull that off. He crossed that out. They looked around. Nobody was in the room. He went, picked up a cloth, and he walked over, and he got the Mary figurine, put her in a cloth. Walked down the hall to his bedroom, went into the closet, opened the closet door, put her up there in the closet, closed the closet door. He said, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. (laughs) A lot of misunderstanding about this person named Mary, okay? What was she really about? What about her story? Uh, She was extremely blessed by God to do this, even though she really was just like you and me. She too had sins. She too had flaws. But she's going to cooperate with God. And when we do that, God blesses us. And she did that. And God blessed her. Okay? But in her case, of course, her obeying God, this changed the whole world. Like our kids and grandkids change our world too, this baby would change the whole world. Back to the story, verse 29. So Mary was greatly troubled. Well, yeah, I guess so. Every time an angel appeared to somebody in the Bible, their first response is always the same. They're afraid. Of course. So she's troubled. And so so she's greatly troubled at his words, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel says, no, in verse 30, the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You'll conceive and you're going to give birth to a son and you're to call him Jesus. Okay? He'll be great. will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the, the throne of his father, David, the Bible says. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. Now notice Mary's immediate response. Verse 34. How? Will this be? I am just a virgin. Would you please put this in your notes? The first person to be skeptical about the virgin birth was Mary. How can this happen? I've never been with a man before. It can't happen. Verse 35, the angel gives the answer. Mary, here's the deal. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Amazing thing. Never fail. And the Bible says, she responds, I am the Lord's servant. May your word uh, to me be fulfilled, and then the angel left her. Now look at those words, I am the Lord's servant. Has God ever come to you and wanted you to do something, and you went, get the wrong person? It yes. can't be me. Would you practice this? When God taps you on the shoulder, no matter how audacious the request, God, this isn't fair, but God, but, and God says, no, I want to use you. You say four words, I'm the Lord's servant. I don't understand it, but I'm the Lord's servant. Say it with me. I'm the Lord's servant. servant. Just practice those words. I don't understand God. It looks impossible. I don't think this can work. But if God's prompted you and you kind of know that you know, don't say but. Don't say when or if. All right, Lord, but you're going to have to do this. This is what you want me to do. And she will be tremendously blessed by God to be included in this amazing plan of God. But then the angel leaves. Now, here's the big idea I want us to see today. 
Mary will discover that honoring God leads to an extreme blessing, yet it is extremely difficult. And the same is true for you and for me. If you've ever heard, just come to Christ and all your problems will go away, uh, no, that's not how it works. In fact, sometimes you, when you surrender to God, <laughs> the attacks can even be worse sometimes. It rains on the just and the unjust, the Bible says. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, okay, but I've overcome the world. So life can be extremely difficult, but you will have the extreme blessing of God if you surrender to him. So Mary's going to have some struggles. You say, what is she struggling with? Well, number one, Mary was misunderstood. She's so excited to tell people. Can you imagine wanting to tell people what has happened? An angel selected her, and here's the situation. She's now pregnant with this child. She is shocked to find out not everybody's going to be excited about her story. Not going to believe it. And like, how's she going to defend it? <laughs> how can she prove this has really happened? And there's no way she is ready for what she's going to face, but she is going to be misunderstood. And I love the story because it's your story and my story. Because you've ever been misunderstood? If you haven't been, you will be. There are times when you will be misunderstood. And my prayer today has been for a month now, as I've kind of given this message to God that he gave to me to give to you, I pray that you and I will do these same things that Mary did when she was misunderstood. How was she misunderstood? Number one, by Joseph. Joseph did not understand. Matthew's account tells us this in verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, circle the word husband, was faithful to the Lord and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce, circle the word divorce, her quietly. Now, wait a minute. I thought they were pledged to be married. What's this deal about her husband and divorce? Well, you have to understand something about marriage in that culture, in that day. There were three stages of marriage in that day. The first stage was engagement. The engagement. This happened when a child was eight or nine years of age. The parents would arrange the marriage. The parents said, this decision is too important to be made by an amateur. Pros need to make it. Uh, parents, can I get an amen in the house? The no kids say, hey, yeah, sign me up for that. I want my mom and dad to pick my mate for me. No, I don't think so. But they did that in that culture, so they were engaged then at eight or nine, okay? And then, though, they would come into the pledging state or the betrothal stage. Betrothals, now, now they're 14 or 15 years of age. And it's been long enough now that the parents are going, is this going to work or not? Or maybe this is not going to work. And the 14 and 15-year-old can say, this is going to work or not going to work. If everybody's in on it now and they're betrothed, this is going to happen, then they'll set up and they'll have the marriage area. Now, by the way, this betrothal was just like a marriage. They referred to it as marriage and divorce because if the fiancé died, if he did, died while they're betrothed, she was referred to as a widow. If they broke up, it was called a divorce. It was taken that seriously. But here's what I want you to note. But there was no sexual intimacy when they had their first date. There was no intimacy when they certainly were engaged or betrothed. No intimacy when they decided they were going to be married. They were not sexually intimate until the day of their wedding. Until they expressed their vows before God. And then before you, they unite physically as one, they're united as one in the eyes of God. Don't get that backward. And that's why in this story, she's in this phase, so she had never been with a man before. And so God's going to perform this miracle that makes no sense. Can you imagine when she comes to Joseph and she says to Joseph, what's going to be happening? And that's her problem number two. Joseph did not understand either. Um, you know, it's a tough thing that, that Joseph didn't understand, but her parents, her parents didn't understand. Now, if you've gone through this, there's some things that like, nobody's got your back, but mom and dad maybe do. If nobody else is going to believe you, it'll be your parents. Joseph, that was tough enough, but now her parents, they don't understand. You say, where'd you get that? In the Bible? No. They're not even mentioned in the New Testament. Interesting. You know, sometimes what's significant is not what's in the Bible, but sometimes what's not in the Bible. 
Just use some logic here. For instance, when Joseph doesn't understand, don't you think she would have gone to her parents for support? We probably would have read about that. Or when Joseph, all of his fears about this, when God told him what was really going on, and they headed to Bethlehem to give birth, the grandma, Mary's mother, was not there. There's no scene of Mary's, you ever thought about that? Mary's mother is not at the scene. Why is it not pictured there? Because there's no mentioning of them there. Because I think we can assume they didn't understand either. This made no sense. How could you do this? So that's where Joseph is going. I can't, this is a ridiculous story, Mary. I mean, you really wanted me to believe this? It's broken my heart. And her parents aren't buying it either. So Mary is dealing with rejection from people who knew her well. Questioning her integrity. You ever have somebody question your integrity that you thought would have your back? So this is really, really tough for her. And so down the line, we're going to find out what happens here. Mary, there's no doubt, like with Joseph going, he's not, he's not going to believe it. He doesn't believe it. He can't buy it. Her parents aren't believing it. So who will believe her? The angel already told her, Elizabeth will believe you. Your Elizabeth, who's way too old to have a baby. I spoke to her too, and she has a miraculous baby. John the Baptist, by the way, was in her womb. We learn later. So if you go to talk to her, now somebody will be behind you. Somebody will believe your story. And so verse 39 tells us this. At that time, Mary got ready and she hurried. I bet she did. Finally, somebody would believe her. She hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, the Bible says. And it says once she arrived there, Scripture continues. I think the Scripture continues. There we go. Here's the key. Here's the key. Even though she was misunderstood, Mary persevered. That's what I wanted us to see. That scripture drives home the point. She, she's heading there. She's hurrying to see that person there. Because even though she was misunderstood, she perseveres through this situation. Because finally, somebody is going to believe her. Now, let me back up just a minute and give you a little background here. How far was this? Was this next door? No. This is about 50 miles. Not an easy deal. She travels 50 miles to the only person who's going to buy her story. And so she goes there. And finally somebody would believe her. Now let me talk to you for just a minute about you. You know what it's like to be misunderstood? If you've been through a bitter divorce, you, do, you know what that's like. If you've been unfairly uh, terminated from work, you know what it's like. If you've been through a complicated bankruptcy or lawsuit, you've been misunderstood. If you've been falsely arrested or accused. If you have a rebellious child who's acting out, you know what it's like for people who don't have all the information to misunderstand you. It's painful. And have you noticed the more you try to begin to explain to people, the worse it gets. You've been falsely accused. And this is really tough. When you think you're trying to honor God and things go wrong, you know, sometimes you even get more devoted to God, the attack can even be worse. What do you do? Maybe you adopted a child of another race or another nation, and people wonder, why did you do that? They don't even think it's right for you to do that. Some of you, when you became a Christian, you were so full of joy, you couldn't wait to tell special people in your life, but they think you've lost your mind. You're not really believing this, are you? You're, you're just spending a lot of time there now. You're, what's, this, your whole life is around this church. What's going on? Maybe you changed churches because you felt it was the best move for your spiritual journey. But your family feels like you've betrayed them. And you're going to be with them at Christmas time. And it's going to be awkward. Because they just, they, just, they just don't understand. Mary's message understood. And the people who should have known weren't there. But here's what's amazing. That's why I want you to see this. Even though she misunderstood, she persevered through that. See, Matthew's account is interesting because it tells us that Joseph was going to divorce her quietly. He's a very respectable man. He didn't want to humiliate her. And so Matthew 1.20 says, after he had considered this, after he considered divorcing her, here's my question. How long did he consider that? Do you wonder? 
You know the conversation. Joseph hears the deal and God did it. And Joseph goes, man, Mary, I don't know. I need some time. Really? I need some time. Was it days? Was it weeks? Was it a month? We don't know. He had some time to figure this out. The only way was to get out of the situation. And so we don't know how long she waited until finally God would deliver. But Mary had to live with this. And by the way, as you'll see later, she had to live with these questions and accusations for 30 years. People who thought she had this baby out of wedlock. Okay. But number two, Mary waited for the Lord to defend her. That's the key. He waited for the Lord to defend her from the injustice or the thing that that unfair that's happening to her. Psalm 135, uh, verse 14 says, For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Okay? If you are honoring God again, you may be having a very difficult season in your life. But listen to me. Listen, listen, listen to me. God's going to vindicate you and he'll defend you one day. It may be weeks, days, months. It may be years. It may be a lifetime, but he'll be there for you. A family came down to see me last night, and they just cried their eyes out. Their son died this year, very difficult. And uh, they said, tonight, the four things that you shared, those are the four things that got us through in this church. And so I thought, boy, I need to make sure tomorrow that I tell the people, would you write down these four things I'm going to give you right now? These four things she did, please put this in a place where you can access it regularly. When you are feeling pressure or you're going through a difficult season in your life, these four things will keep you on point, even when the circumstances haven't changed. Number one, she served. Look at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and she hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zacharias' home and she greeted Elizabeth, okay? When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby, doesn't say a fetus, it says a baby, leaped in her womb. Now, very significant here. Uh, She goes to see Elizabeth. Uh, She's married to uh, Zechariah, who's a pastor. And again, as I mentioned, this is John the Baptist, who's in her womb, verse 42. So, in a loud voice, Elizabeth says to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. So her parents and Joseph don't understand, but can you imagine what that was like for Mary when she walked into that house and she said, I get it, an angel came to me too. And she's crying like a baby in her arms, I guarantee you. Finally, somebody believes, and you know that she was thrilled with that. Can I say, family of God, a time out for just a minute. Would you understand? So many people need words of encouragement in all kinds of seasons. But as I said before, in this season particularly, Would you find ways to encourage people around you? Here's why. During the Christmas season, our highs just seem higher, right? But our lows seem lower. It's just the way it is. Some of the greatest pain for for many people is in this season of the year. Can I suggest you try something as a family this year? Um, Try this out. After the kids have gone to bed, go around the circle and say, hey, why don't we all share maybe a high this past year? Something was just a really a neat thing that happened this year in your life. And share something that was hard for you this year. Let's all do that. And the leader has to go first. If you'll do that, here's what I'll promise you. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry. There are going to be tears. But there's going to be some hugs and some, some, some encouragement. Because some people have a chance to say something that needs to be said. And somebody will encourage them. And your relationship will go deeper. You you find ways to encourage people, especially in this season. Every time you walk on this campus, every time you walk on this campus, I promise you, you're walking past some people who have not seen a smile all week. Some people have not heard a kind word all week. You assume every person you walk by, you're the only smile or the only good morning or greeting they're ever going to have. You remember that. Well, back to our story, verse 56. So Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, and then she returned home. Hey, women, let me ask you a question. What what does a single woman do who goes to see this older relative 
who's in her third trimester, what does she do for three months at her home? What does she do for the last three months of her pregnancy? You know what she does. She serves, right? You serve. You cook meals, you do the wash, you do the dishes, you sweep the floors. You think Zechariah's going to do it? I don't think so. No, she's there, man, and she's going to do all the... I'm here to serve you. You know she does that. I'm guessing she held Elizabeth's hand when she was delivering John the Baptist. She probably changed his little diaper, maybe even fed him or something like that before she headed out. Because here's the bottom line. What she did was so smart. You get your mind off yourself by serving someone else. And that, I mean, when you're in your tough season, that's when you need to do that. You'll be healthy if you do that regularly. But when you're hurting, that's the most important thing you can do. Instead of dwelling on your difficulties, you find somebody you can serve and you serve them. And by the way, if you're at Connection Point, you have found the right place. That's the DNA of this church. This is one of the best serving churches in America. It really is. And you have chances to serve here at Christmas season, but you have chances to serve here year round. I'm just going to be honest with you. John, I didn't ask his permission to say this, but I'm going to say it. If you don't like to serve, you're going to get real tired of having chances to sign up to serve. Because there are chances to serve year round in this wonderful church. And please take advantage of that. What an opportunity to do that in every season of your life. Jesus said, that's my mission statement. And it's your mission statement as a church. Here's what he said, Luke Luke 9, 24, in his teaching later in his life, he said, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to, or loses their life for me will save it. When you sacrifice for others, so the cause, the bigger, grander cause, loving God and loving people, that's why you're here. That's why you breathe. And here's what's amazing. I look across this room. I know enough stories here. Some of you are here today because I know the first time you came here was Christmas week. Some of you came on Christmas, for Christmas service, and you started your journey. And now you know the joy, even in the midst of pain. Some of you are going through a difficult season in your life, and you had nowhere else to turn, and somebody invited you to come, and you began your journey with Christ. Hey, would you be that for somebody? Somebody's in your world right now. You know, the statistics would say at Christmas season, did you know about 90% of people who are not churched will accept your invitation to attend church if they are invited. Nine out of ten. Now you may have to do it five or six times. Okay? Don't be annoying. <laughs> but do be caring. And say, I really want to come. I'll really come to the service you can come to. We'll meet you and walk in together. We'll help you get the kids where they need to be. Bring them to Jesus. And your life will be changed And so will there. Share the joy that Christ has given to you. Don't keep it to yourself. Here's the second thing she did. She sang. She composes this song in Luke chapter 1. And it's a beautiful song because she's quoting Old Testament scriptures. Now, 14, 15 year old, listen to me. She had memorized the Old Testament. Some scriptures she had memorized. And she writes a song from scriptures she'd memorized. You ever hear the phrase, whistle while you work? I picture her singing this song as she, she worked all over the house. She just sang this song. We're told some of the words of the song, verse 46. She said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I'm a nowhere person, a no-name person from a nowhere town. What in the world? And you're going to, God, you, you're delivering Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through me. Can't get over it. Verse 48, he's been mindful. The Lord has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. I'm nothing, she's saying. And from now on, even all generations are going to call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name at connection point in 2019. They're still going to be talking about me and I'm nothing. But Lord, you're something. (laughs) and You're going to use me for this purpose. And listen to me. Don't you, don't you think your heart wasn't broken? Her heart was broken over Joseph's response to her and her parents bailing on her. Her heart was wondering what's it going to be like when I go back home. But she waited for, she trusted in the Lord to perform his miraculous work in his time for his glory of giving birth to Christ through her. And so holy is his name. She can't say it enough. She can't keep it inside. The music speaks to the heart, doesn't it? And You don't have to be able to sing. 
Some of you don't sing well, but you can still make a joyful noise. Uh, you don't have to play an instrument to love music. But listen, music, there's no doubt, music, it touches the heart in some ways other things can. It can calm you. Uh, it can give you celebration, right? Uh, it can inspire, it can fire you up, inspire you. Many of you know that my most difficult Christmas, I've told you about before in past years, was in 1992. So my son uh, turned nine years of age. And uh, that was, I was nine when I had my first Christmas after my dad had died. And I was nine years old. And I started crying in December and I couldn't stop. And I didn't know what was going on. And um, it was the unconditional love of the elders of this church and my wife. But I said to them, I don't care if I ever preach again. I just want to smile again. I just want to have joy again. Now, listen, when you have hurt badly enough that you say, I don't, the thing you love to do, you don't care about doing anymore. Have you ever hurt that deeply? If you have, you know what I'm talking about. And so it was their unconditional love, but it was also like in the middle of the night when I would be grieving, it was music, songs about things I believed about God that I knew were true. God, I don't get the fact that you took my dad away. And God, I'm telling people how great you are. And you took my dad, really? I look at my son, you would take his dad, really? I had to come to grips with that. Or I was done. I sure wasn't going to be telling anybody about him. So I had to overcome that. And it was through the power of music that did that for me. And the same is true for you, the challenges that you're facing. I mean, there are some things that you're going through now. And listen, all you, all you can do is just say, this is what I believe about God. I may not be feeling it, but I believe it from my soul. And God, would you use this? Lord, would you teach me lessons in this season? Pray this prayer when you're, you're in the worst place you've been. Lord, will you teach me things in this season I would not learn any other way? I hate that it works that way, but it does. And sometimes when you're waiting on the Lord, you've done everything you can do. And all you can do is come to God. God, I'm hanging on to you. I'm staying focused on you. And number three, she stayed where she was at. Now, what do I mean by that? She stayed with Elizabeth for three months, but that wasn't a big deal. Look at verse 56. It says they stayed. <clears throat> Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So did you get that? Number three, she stayed, the quick point came up quick. She stayed where she was. Okay, So she stayed where she was. That means she went back to her hometown. She didn't run away. Are you with me? When you're hurting, you want to run away. People are hurting sometimes, they back off from family and friends. They back off the church. Sometimes, oh, I'm, I'm going to move. That's usually not the answer. Now, sometimes with a serious addiction, sometimes you do need to move to get away from the bad influences in your life. But most of the time, that's not the answer because, you know, you can't run away from yourself, you know. You can't run away from God. So you have to kind of stay with it. And it's tough. She's going back to where she knows all the rumors that are going on about her. And she has to face this and deal with it for 30 years yet. So she heads home. And it's going to be a tough way to go. Now, see, you've said that two or three times. 30 years, this was a rumor? Let me show you. Jesus is in his ministry. His enemies are trying to trap him and always accusing him. And they said one time to Jesus in John 8, verse 41, they said this. Oh, we are not illegitimate children. Like you are, we all know you were born out of wedlock, right? For 30 years they said this. Imagine every time Mary went to the store, there are people went, yeah, there she is. You know, you know about her? Oh, yeah, she's the one, yeah. She had to deal with that for three decades. You ever walk around with an X on your back? And you sense people are whispering? They have no idea what's going on? It is so tempting just to run away and hide get a fresh start, but it's not the answer. It's not the answer. Lee Ezell found that out. She was raped when she was 17 years old. Now, when you're raped when you're 17 years old, that's brutal. 
but she also became pregnant. That hardly ever happens, by the way, but it happened to her. 17 years old, she was raped and she became pregnant. In her book, The Missing Piece, she writes about the fact that her mother was an alcoholic. Her mother begged her, just, honey, just get out of town. Just get out of town. You know, people kind of used to do that. Just get out of town until it's over, have the baby, then come back. Don't embarrass the family name. She was counseled, abort the baby. I mean, you were raped after all, you know, my goodness. Nobody could blame you for aborting the baby. Do that. Problem is, she'd become a Christian. And uh, through God's grace, she came upon scripture of Psalm 139, right in the middle of the Bible, where it says in verse 13, you created my inmost being. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in this secret place. God knit me together in the womb of my mother, see, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. And she heard that and she realized no matter what people were saying to her, this is a baby inside of her. It's a person. And she said, wait a minute, abortion? She said, no, that's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So I'm going to deliver this baby. And she chose to do that. At 17, they made sure to give that baby up for adoption to Christian parents, wonderful Christian parents. They adopted the baby. And guess what? They had a reunion on her 20th birthday. 20 years later, she got to meet her biological daughter. And you know what happened when they came together? You know what her daughter said to her mom? Mom, I want to teach you about Jesus Christ. <laughs> and Lee said, honey, you helped lead me to Christ when you were in my womb. Only God. Only God can take the most difficult thing in your life when you stick it out and turn it into something for his glory. You refuse the temptation to run away. Don't you dare cut off your family and friends. Don't run away from the church. You tough it out. You keep plugging away. When you do, you'll find out who your real friends are. And you're going to grow through the process. Like I said, you'll learn things you won't learn any other way. You will mature through the process. And Mary did that. But the fourth thing she did was she stayed faithful. Okay? She stayed faithful. And God blessed her. Here's the end of the story for today. Verse 20 in Matthew's account. It says, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then the Christmas story unfolds, and John's going to walk with you through that the next couple of weeks in Christmas week. Let me say this to you today. In this season of your life, especially if this is the difficult Christmas season you're facing, as it was for Mary. She could not just make everything right. You'd do anything if you could just make it all right. Make it go away. Wake up tomorrow and the nightmare's over. No. You keep trusting in the Lord. God, let there be joy. It's not the circumstances have changed. It's something on the inside. It's your presence, your spirit, and your faithful word will be true. Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. It happened for Mary in Nazareth over 2,000 years ago. And that can happen for you Anytime, any place, anywhere, and even right now, right here. Would you quietly stand? I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Amy Grant sang a song that I asked the team to sing today. But I want us to pray this prayer. I want you to make this your prayer. If this is from your heart, you repeat these words after me. If you will, would you please close your eyes and here's the prayer. I'll lead you in the prayer. Lord, repeat it after me out loud. Lord, Lord hold, me together. hold me together. Be forever near me. Help me be strong. Breath of heaven. God, send your breath, your Holy Spirit to us. 
as we focus on you. When we have the highest highs and the lowest lows, when we will find that you are faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. heaven, the Holy Spirit would encourage you and fill you as you go and tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. We hope that you will invite people to join us for the Christmas services uh, in here in a few weeks. Don't forget to stop in the lobby and grab some invites and the special Christmas card. Write a little note. Um, the service times are on the back and pop that in the mail and invite some folks to join us to hear the good news of Jesus. We're so glad that you were with us today to worship. We hope that you have a great week and we'll see you next weekend.